Okay, welcome to this episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. My name is Paul Burgess, as always, and I am here today with an interesting young guy, actually, Tom Foxley. Tom, how are you, mate? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good, yeah, I'm good. The um, It's interesting. The reason I got Tom on is because he runs a podcast himself called uh, The Athletic Movement, and the alpha movement. Oh, the, sorry, the alpha. Sorry, I'm talking about my own one now. That's right. <laughs> the alpha movement. And um, do you know what? I'm even reading that off a piece of paper and I got it wrong. That's how bad my day's been. And um, uh, But there's some real interesting stuff that I've, I've been listening to a few of the, the episodes. And um, a lot of it is based around um, life optimization and getting the, the, the largest return for the smallest amount of effort and that kind of thing. So before we get cracking into all that interesting stuff, tell us about you where you've been, what your journey's been, because I know it's been really quite quite a struggle on some of it, and it's an interesting yeah, it's, it's one. It's so, been up and down. It's been up and so down. tell us those, more. Those, uh, those hard times, I think, are almost entirely necessary for, for a successful life um, in, in some regards. I think they make you who you are. But yeah, so I, I started out, um, well, I suppose you've got to go all the way back to the beginning, when I was, I had a pretty shit time in school, to be honest. Um, wasn't great, it wasn't great fun, lots of bullying, um, but like, as I said, it's by the by. Um, this kind of affected my confidence massively and then one day um, like I just like I think I was at school one day and I got suggested to read a book and I've never really been big into books before and that book was Bounce by Matthew Syed and that completely changed my mindset the idea that my mindset was malleable and I could change my mind and how my how my thought process worked was huge it really really helped me and from there, I just decided to set myself a kind of a really orga- audacious, ludicrous goal. Um, and at that point, I was about 10 stone, uh, about six foot. So I was pretty skinny. And I decided that I would like to become a Royal Marines Commando. Um, long story short, I've done that. I'm, I'm a reservist. Um, it's like a part-time job. Um, and my big thing there was I used a very small amount of training time to get to to achieve a very big goal that typically requires a lot of training time. Whilst I'm doing that, I kind of figured out that my mindset was changing at the same time. That started off with preparing myself physically, and that that, that really, really helped me. And if we fast forward now, I've been a personal trainer for quite a long time, kind of four years now, or quite a long time, not really in the industry, but for four years now, um, I'm now working online mostly with guys that want to flip their mindset around training, um, get in the best shape of their life and a lot of it is around that 80-20 principle of what's the smallest effort we can apply in return and get the hugest returns. So this is interesting, I've, I've written a few um, training programs for people that want to take the um, test to get into the Marines yep. and that is some hard work, I mean it's, it's brutal some of it. And um and a and a good friend of mine, uh, Nick Jones, who's been on on here before, and uh, is a strength and conditioning coach for um, a lot of uh, Team GB athletes um, and other world class athletes around around the globe, uh, has done that induction course and tried to get in and so on. And physically, he was fine. Uh, fitness wise, he was fine, but there was an issue with uh, a back injury that he had, and, and they take you straight out if you've got anything like yeah. that but he said it was it was brutal and he said if if you're going to advise anybody to do it the one thing they've got to do is run and just keep running because that's one of the major major things that they make you do and almost until you fall over so just just focusing on that for a second how is it that you became fit enough strong enough and all the rest of it in in a relatively short period of time doing a relatively short amount of of work Okay, so the biggest thing I did was I looked to the endurance world and I, I kind of uncovered this idea of black hole training where in endurance you've kind of got five heart rate zones, um, like four and five being completely anaerobic, um, one, two being um, completely aerobic, and then three that's that kind of race pace where you're kind of almost fluctuating between the two. A lot of people spend far too much time in zone three where you're pushing yourself hard but not hard enough to get those kind of anaerobic or strength gains, but you're not pushing yourself, um, you're not going slowly enough to get those aerobic gains. And as a result, you're never going to recover properly. You're going to find it hard to recover and you just won't get those gains. So what I did is I really prioritized strength and movement above anything else. If I was moving well, I was happy. Um, 
mind that this results in a smaller chance of injury, which is huge in that kind of environment. But it, it enables you to get more power output. It's going to be a lot more efficient. And then I did a very, very slow run. It's like it's also almost got to feel like like too easy. Yeah. It's got to be too easy. It's got to, like there's as soon as you start pushing into that zone three, you just you're just going to lose it all. So that's what I kind of did. I did one very very slow run once every seven to ten days. Didn't run more than five miles. Um, and that's that's kind of the, the, the very bare bone basics of yeah. it. Well, this is interesting because I've had a, a bit of a conversation with a guy called Rob Wolf recently, who um, I follow massively. He's, I think he's a, he's a great guy. Um, and also there's another chap called um, Alex Vida who wrote a book called The Hybrid Athlete, which if you haven't read, it's worth reading. I'll make a note of that, Hybrid uh, Athlete. And... Um, both of them are very much, if you want to build up your aerobic capacity so that you are better in your sport, in your competition, then you've got to do this very low, uh, slow, uh, low intensity cardio, which realistically they try, they kind of look at it as 180 beats minus your age. And if you stick around that sort of number, which will seem almost like, like you say, too easy, yeah. That's where you'll build your aerobic capacity, so that when you're going anaerobic, you'll be able to, you'll have a better engine, basically. That's entirely. Um, and too many people, like you say, too many people go too hard because they feel as though they've got to be feeling it at the end of their session. Um, yeah. and, and, and it's really good. You get that endorphin rush. You get that yeah. run as high when you're in zone three, and you love it. And that's why people just go out and hit those. Like endurance cyclists, I find the worst. Um, it, like they just love getting out on their bike and say, "Yeah, I did 120 miles this weekend on Saturday and Sunday." Yeah. And they just, and then they wonder why they can't put on any muscle mass. Um, they're also gaining fat. They feel shit. Um, their energy is awful, and they just like they can't live the life they want to live. Yeah, injuries and no recovery. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Also, I find what goes hand in hand is they think that training is going to resolve all their problems. Yeah, but they don't pay attention to recovery, sleep, nutrition, that kind of stuff, mobility. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, mean, I get clients that are highly stressed and are, and are burning the candles at both ends and, and got a you know big pressure job and everything else. The first thing I'll probably do is tell them to stop training. And they yeah. and they look at me like, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, I'll, I'll get fat. And, and I say, yeah, and also when you stop training, I need you to eat more as well. And they go, oh, no, that's it, that's it. That, you, you, I can't take that. You, 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 there must be some other way. And um, and it's interesting how once they actually buy into it, how much better they feel, and really quickly as well. Yeah, you're bang on. You're bang on. But there, there you go. Um, okay, so you come out of school, you do the Marines, and then yeah. you decide I'm gonna come away from all this uh, feeling of bullying and so on and so forth. And and then there was a, a small spell of kind of introverted thinking and feeling a bit depressed about things for a while. Yeah. So, like, basically, I'm, I'm not really sure what caused it, but I wasn't really making progress. And I was, I, I was, I was kind of stuck. I was, I was living with my auntie. My parents moved away. Uh, not, this isn't a sob story. It's just what happened. Yeah. Um, it was, as I said, it's essential in doing what I wanted to do or what I do now. But, yeah, I was just not in a good place. And I just didn't really have, have that drive. And I was, I was kind of stuck where I was. And, again... That's when I started looking into personal training and like redeveloping. Like the reason why I went the reserve option instead of full time, um, well, two reasons mainly. One of them because I've got an amazing girlfriend and that would have suffered. But secondly, I want to do something to help other people, and I know that fitness was was my chance to do that. And I kind of at that point it really solidified my idea that I basically I nicked a Tony Robbins quote. Um, and I've, I've said it a few times now, so I'm going to try and take it as my own. But the master in physical body is the foundation of a, is a foundation of a successful life. So I like I've embodied that in everything I do now, and that's what I kind of push towards. People. Okay. T- talking to Tony Robbins, and I don't want this to be a, uh, a a sales pitch for for his very expensive products. But have you ever been to any of his seminars? No, I was on an event at, when uh, UPW he was on. Um, so I didn't manage to get it this time, but I will be. Okay. I will be. And do you know if he still actually runs those? Because I'm not sure. Because he has a lot of people over here that are trained by or approved by, and then I, I think I think he does the big events. Yeah, he, he does the mastery. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I think he does unleash the power. Okay. 
So I did, um, the first time he ever came to the UK, which was probably before you were born, I did his, uh, I did a couple of bits in the UK. One was the Unleashed Power Within Weekend, you do your fire walk and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I've done Date With Destiny in, in uh, South France. He ran that in Cannes, the first time I came to Europe with it. Um, Age, oh, well, it must be 20 years ago. Um, uh, interesting guy, and he's still plugging away now, still still doing his thing and creating that that huge industry that he creates. From your perspective, obviously, it's someone that's influenced you. Um, who else have you found useful in that self-development arena? Because, you know, realistically, you're still quite young. Yeah. Like you say, you're, you're new into the industry as such. It's four years since you've been been uh, been in and doing your thing from a first personal trainer point of view. You've decided to start a podcast, which you've got like 20-odd um, episodes on there now, and it's all going well. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a definite time where things change and you become someone who wants to be more productive in a wider range of things rather than I'm going to go to a gym and I'm going to do my 10 sessions today and everyone's going to get their hour with me and then I'm going to go home and do the whole thing again tomorrow. You know, yeah. that, that's quite a destructive life in my opinion. So what, was, what has taken you to start branching out and do some other things? Um, the, the biggest moment was well when I realised I was working like ridiculous hours and it was a ridiculous split shift and I hated it and it was making me feel shit and I thought I need to build something that's going to make me feel a better human being. That was a big part of it. Um, but yeah, and then to go into your... Well, I, I think the other thing as well is... It, to be honest with you, it wasn't entirely um, self-obsessed. Like, I do want to kind of get to more people, and I know that what I can do is going to be slightly bigger. But what prompted that, I think, was that taking a step back, the objectivity. It was kind of when, like, I don't know whether you're you're into the mindset kind of stuff or, like, whether you work in, in terms of meditation or something, but I started meditating. Like, for me, that... That doesn't mean sitting there in a saffron robe with candles burning and stuff like that. It means just paying attention to my thoughts, being <coughs> quiet for a bit, and just observing what's happening. And once I took that step back and calmed my mind, it made me realise that the world needs something bigger than not just another personal trainer doing, as you said, 10, 14 hours a yeah. day and just burning candles both ends. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a massive believer in meditation. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, and not enough people use it because they have that preconceived idea of it's all a bit woo woo but actually nowadays we've got some really good apps and the I think the the way people see it nowadays and perceive it is, is changing and they're, they're understanding that you can bring it into a modern lifestyle and have massive benefits for it and in actual fact if you are living a modern lifestyle it's almost essential to do it because because oh, yeah. otherwise you just don't get get the balance that you need yeah, um, I think if you look at people like Tim Ferriss, for example, like those those very high end earners, and they've started to say like, actually, this is what I do, yeah. and it's like that starts to filter down to the rest of us from that point. Yeah, kind of. Um, so you you decide right, I want a podcast because I want to get my message out there. I guess and that's why you did it yeah. um, to try and get more more people aware of you and what you do and so on and so forth. A client comes to you and he says, right, I want you to work with me. What's your approach? Do you um, sit there and say, right, go and listen to these episodes, or do you say, oh, I'll now assess you first, or what, what? What do you do when someone comes into your process? So generally, when someone comes up to me, they've been exposed to me quite a lot, so they'll probably have listened to a few episodes of my podcast. They'll probably be in my private Facebook group where, like, and they just get to know me. Um, from that point on, I'd probably jump on a call with them if they need it, and it's not going to be like. Like I, I, I try to implement this, this like from a business point of view, I try to implement this ridiculous thing where it's like a very hard driven sales pitch and like everything was like so neat and had to fit into this box, but it just wasn't me and like it was coming across and I wanted to help more people, not like put people off and make me think like right. make them think I was an idiot and just trying to sell them stuff. Um and amazingly once you start to help people, people want to use you. So um, so most people who are coming to me just hear about me, they get exposed to me lots and lots and lots and lots, and then they'll usually say, Can I work with you? And that's that's where it kind of gets to. And and where are you finding your your most effective? In other words, is it using your eighty twenty rule? Is it using 
um, exercise or do you use some sort of nutrition or what, what way do you feel as though you're imparting the most amount of benefit? Okay, so the, the most important thing, I think I get sleep sorted. Like yeah. That is the number one thing. Like Anyone who comes to me, I'll optimise their sleep first and try and look at whether they're using blackout blinds or like even well, before we get into that stuff, are they sleeping a decent amount of time? Is it regular? Is there like extensive blue light exposure before they go to bed? Is it just like that, that kind of that horrible, the horrible sleep pattern that so many people are in, like sleeps, the sleeps of the dead, yeah. uh, not sleeping of dead, sorry, or sleeps of the week. It's like such a idea that infiltrates everything we do. And I, I hate that idea. I really, really don't like the way that people think that it's for the week, but it's going to optimize the rest. It's going to allow you to recover from the training. It's going to allow you to um, just function better as a human being. You're cognitively, you're just like there, yeah. it's working. Um, from that point, I generally get a very, very basic nutrition outline for them. No, I don't go, again, it's back to that 80 20 rule. I'll try and give them the very smallest amount that I can give them um, to allow them to discover for themselves. That's, that's something else I'm quite a big believer in. I don't want to say, these are your guidelines. These, like, this is exactly how much carbohydrate you eat per day. I want to allow them to discover, or this is exactly what meal you eat per day. Um, I want to allow them to discover and evolve because I think that's a big part of thing. No one's going to stick to a plan or very a very small amount of people are going to stick exactly to a plan they're given. They want to put their own spin on things. Um, and then once I've got that sorted, I'll go into the, the training side of things, which is mostly strength-based um, with some sort of CrossFit style element to it. Okay. Um, just go back to the sleep briefly because this is interesting to me. I get a lot of clients have those those issues with sleep. So a client comes to you and he says, yes, I sleep perfectly well every night. I sleep from 10.30 until 7 o'clock. Yeah. And I normally say to him, so you never get up and go to the toilet or anything like that. They say, oh, yeah, I'll get up once or twice. But on that, I sleep really well. What would be your approach to getting him to sleep solidly through the night rather than having this disturbed? Because that disturbed sleep is not sleep. That's getting up physically, walking to a bathroom, and then walking back again and get back into bed, that's broken sleep as far as I'm concerned. So do you have anything that you use or any techniques you use? I would go for that pure disciplined approach. Like you are not getting out of bed until it's time. Surprising that works a, a surprising number of times. Yeah, yeah. Like you are in bed at this time and you're out of bed at that time. And in between those times, I don't care if you're going to wet yourself. Like that is, like that's all you're allowed. To, like you're not getting out. Um, other than that, is putting a very, I think, like a very structured bedtime routine. Right. Like if we look at children, they've got a very structured bedtime routine. That's what we're putting. Like you, you finish it, you have your dinner, you get like, you watch like maybe a tiny bit of TV, but then you get stories and then you get baths and then you yeah. get more stories and you're in bed. It's a very slow winding down cognitively. And I think people are missing that. It's like, right, blue light, blue light, blue light on the TV, turn off the TV bed. And, and sit like, in bed and read your out and look at your iPad. Yeah, oh, exactly, exactly. Um, and at that point, people just aren't going to sleep properly. And that, I think that evening routine, like you can supplement with ZMA and stuff, but I, I don't think it's entirely necessary. I think just get that routine, like get that yeah. habit sorted. Okay, so then the client says, okay, I, um, I've got a great routine, but I wake up around uh, 3 o'clock in the morning every, every night, and then I find it difficult to get back to sleep. What's going on? Do you? Because that's quite common, right? Yeah. So, do you have an approach for that? Honestly, no, I don't. Okay. I, I don't have that, that much approach. Like, go for it. If you do, you have that quite a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, if you no, say no. people, they say, "Oh, yeah, I normally get up." And if you say to me, "You get up somewhere like three o'clock, three thirty and say, "Yeah, yeah, normally." They go, "Okay, interesting." Um, and and from from my perspective, because obviously I'm approaching slightly differently, but from my perspective, it's normally, um, or has been shown in Chinese medicine, it's certainly to be. A liver function issue and it ends up being um, a time where that liver is really working hard um, and it it just wakes you up in the process and what I have found is that if you are looking at a client like that they have normally got some other underlying issues liver wise going on so if you start looking at cleansing that liver over a period of time with the nutrition and a couple of things that you can put in, like maybe milk thistle or green tea a little bit more, especially 
coming up to the evening and use that in your wind down routine that you're talking about, it just supports that liver function a bit more and they tend to be able to sleep through okay, rather okay. than waking up. Because if they're woken up for no other reason, if they're woken up because their liver's given a bit of drip and it's and it's stimulated a bit of cortisol in their system and they're up, immediately they think, oh, I've got to go for a week. So yeah. they get up and go to the toilet and then it's all up and messing around and disturbed sleep and, and whatnot. And um, if you can avoid that initial getting up, then they don't get into that habit of saying, right, it must be because I need the toilet. I like that. So um, it, it's quite an interesting one to use with people. You find that it makes a big difference to them a lot of the time. But anyway, yeah. Not sure, totally separate. Yeah, write, write it down and, uh, and I'll invoice you later. So, um, okay, so tell us about the podcast because I've listened to a few uh, episodes and they're quite varied. Yeah. And lots of different people on there doing different things. Um, what are you personally getting from it? Because... For the, just from a selfish perspective, I get some really great people on here, you included, that I would never get in front of otherwise, because you know you. I've got somebody coming on the, uh, uh, tomorrow. I'm actually speaking to him, a guy called Mike Morelli, who is massive in the states, and I've had a few people on Mike Matthews, another guy, and so on. Um, and I get in front of them because we've got this medium that they want to talk about, and you know I've got a few people that listen to it bizarrely I don't know why but um, but you get to have a conversation with somebody and and ask them your own questions that you want to find out about yeah. right so it's almost like me being quite selfish and saying well I want to find out this and if anyone else wants to listen to it then that's up to them but uh, you know this is for my benefit so what are you finding you're getting from doing your podcast so again like as you said I get an opportunity to speak to some amazing people um like, just a shameless plug, had AJ Roberts on. Um, I've got Kenny Sturette coming on soon. Um, Brian McKenzie, Rob Wolf is coming on my show as well. Yeah, um, loads of people that have just been massively influential. Chris Akabusi was, was a recent one. Um, but it started off, like, trying to trying to define what was alpha and what was, like, what was different. And that happened with about three episodes. It was just, like, yeah. confidence in doing what you want. I said, okay, right, that, that kind of defeats the whole point of the, of the podcast. So now it's moved on a lot about mindset and what motivates people what motivates people to be the best they are and as I said a lot of people have that very very negative period in their life um, for example Simon Lovell talked about his drug drug addiction um, we talked, Sam Chapman talked about her depression um, lots of that lots about that and like that gives me a chance to really selfishly like, what's going to motivate me? What's going to stop me being lazy? What's going to keep me on that front edge? And I find that, like, as Rob Wolf says in his podcast, like, the more you, the more you look for what you're interested in, the more people enjoy it, which is really interesting. So, like, I'm just, I'm just, like, basically, I look at someone who I really want to speak to, and I go, what do I want to find out from them? Like, and that's it. Yeah. Like, it's, it's not that big. It's, it's like, there's no, like, overarching goal. I just want to be, like, listen to people that are interesting. Um, the I think um, when we look at motivation, self motivation of clients, that's a massive, massive area that a lot of coaches completely ignore. Because what happens is you can set out your your sleep routine and your nutrition plan and your training plan and all this sort of nonsense, but if the client themselves don't buy into it because they're not motivated in what in a certain way to get them out of bed or to take action on that sleeping routine or to to eat the certain foods it's it's all pointless you know you can do the best job ever but if there's no motivation from the client to carry it out then we've got a problem because yeah. the results that do not come are then your fault because you're the coach so understanding people and how they can be motivated themselves i think is is hugely hugely important um what what are you finding is the best way to get people to con to be self disciplined and motivated to continue on their journey and instead of just throwing the towel in after five days because I haven't seen twenty pounds weight loss or something. <laughs> so I think the biggest thing that I've learned is finding out whether they're a visual person, a kinesthetic, an audit or an auditory person. So do they like when it comes to goals, are they going to visualise the goal? Are they going to like understand what it looks like, or are they going to feel it, or are they going to know what it sounds like? And lots of different people 
work in lots of different ways. Like you, you'll even hear it in what they say. So for me, um, I'm a very like kinesthetic person. I, I talk about how things feel to me and like how um, how it will feel when I succeed in my goal. When like my podcast hits half a million downloads, or when I do like two and a half times body weight back squat, like what what is going to go through, like what is going to feel like then? But people work in very different ways. So when we're going through goal setting, I will try and try and tailor it to what they're going to feel or what they're going to see or what they're going to hear as a result, and then it's building up that picture, building up that. Or, or the sound or whatever yeah. like building up the, the feeling within them that that is the like it's achievable and they're picturing it and it's really vibrant and everything's turned up to 10 and that is how generally I find works best for people okay and so you spend a lot of time sitting with them and actually almost um, using a one to one coaching method to get into their own mind and, and get them to feel it and visualise yeah. it and all that kind of stuff which, so, which is unusual when, sorry. sorry, which is unusual with coaches in the industry. Generally, what I'm trying to do is differentiate you and other people that I know, and my, I'd include myself, differentiate us from the normal PT or dietitian that you see in a in a gym or in a clinic, in that they have a, a almost like one string to their bow, and that's it. And they yeah. don't they don't take into account all these other things that you need to use as tools to get your clients to be compliant so that they can actually benefit. Um, 100%. And, and it's rare that you find it. A lot of people, like I say, generally just go down one road and they, they, they tend to forget the other things. Yeah, and that's the difference between a, a coach who gets results and a coach who doesn't get results. Yeah, absolutely. Just having those other tools and like the goal setting stuff or like the, the, the higher level caring, that kind of stuff that, that enables people to get better results. Okay, so... Top tips from you then for, for for what you think is the best way to influence people to be better. One is to sleep. Yes. Right. Yeah. What else do you what else do you try and get them to do or understand so that they can implement are it into we, their own are lives? Are we talking physical or mindset? You tell me. Okay, good. Um, the first thing is to understand that the talent myth isn't isn't a thing, like it's a myth. So that idea that you're destined to be a negative version or you're destined to be one thing. The thing is, as I said earlier, your your mindset is malleable. You, by giving yourself different stimuli and believing in a different goal, you're going to get to a different place eventually. Like This is like basically a very a, a, a poor man's Tony Robbins here. Like just If you visualise that end goal and you know that it's, it's capable, then your, your destiny, your outcome will completely change. Yeah. So understanding that talent myth is, is not a real thing. Um, and then we kind of, I think it's getting strong. I think lots of people underestimate getting strong and having that, that baseline of strength. And then from there, well, as a huge part of that is movement. Like what I find quite difficult now is as I'm coaching people online or 80% of my people are online that I can't, get with them and keep teaching them to move well. I love that. I really like that's why I'm still running CrossFit Palestra. We've got ten members and we train outside with kettlebells and just throw them around and have a laugh. But it's it, that's why I love like being with people and teaching them to move well. And that that's kind of my thing that I, I struggle to get across to people because it's it's such like a, a gratifying thing. Um, and the other thing is just no one knows how to move well. It's it's yeah. astonishing. Um, no like you're born and you move almost perfectly <laughs> like almost perfectly and then you stick crappy shoes on people and you make them sit down at school for how many hours a day and like obviously they start to move poorly and get injuries and their back hurts when they run and their knees cave in and all that kind of stuff yeah and then worse is they start exercising and yeah. they do the same exercise all the time so if if you're a runner you end up running thousands of miles with repetitive stress and impact on the same joints over and over again yeah. which you do nothing for until there's an injury or someone gets into their weight training and they do you know bench and dumbbells and pull-ups and all the rest of it but they don't look at any shoulder mobility or thoracic spine extension or anything like that they just go right it's get big and strong and all the rest of it and that's why they're all caving in at the front and they can't do a squat because 
their their hips are tucking under and all the rest of it. But yeah. and then you try and take them back to almost the start of their of their process and say, right, let's just forget all the stuff you've done. Let's just see if you can get your hips mobile now. Yeah. And they go, oh, yeah, but that's really boring. Let's do something else. And go, well, I'll tell you what, if you get this right, you'll be able to do so much more. And yet you find this resistance with them where you'd spend an hour mobilising the hip movement and then they can actually get into a proper squat with a straight back and everything else. And then to try and get them to continue to do that for the next week is almost the most difficult thing in the world. So getting them to realise that you do need to take one or two steps back before you can get to another level yeah. is, is really difficult. I don't think it's even one or two steps back. I think it's just stopping and saying actually this is where I need to be and yeah. it's that idea of having a very short term goal and they just think oh I've seen whoever on the cover of whatever magazine do this in this in like an X amount of time whereas like they, they're not that person they, they don't have everything at their disposal, uh, disposal and they haven't been taught to move well and the thing with movement as well is there's such like simple simple theories behind it like just move core to extremity like the biggest joints get loaded first that, yeah. that kind of thing like maintain the neutral spine understand how to brace um, create torque in the joints so the, the joint is stable and people just don't kind of understand that thing and it doesn't take long to go back and like and to understand why you move like that and what the benefits of it are and as a result of that get far beyond wherever you, you thought you would be or you could be before you started doing that yeah absolutely so movement sleep get some strength Build some confidence. Yep. Get out of your comfort zone. Go and do stuff that you didn't think you could do because all of a sudden you're going to learn. Actually, you, you are not restricted by your what they call talent, if you like, yep. and you can actually do anything as long as you um, go on with it. Do you do you buy into the uh, the theory that if you practice it for ten thousand hours, you'll you'll become good at something? So the first time I heard about that was the the book bounce. And he says, 10,000 hours, perfect. Like, but then he, like, there's a caveat that people forget. Actually, there's two interesting caveats on that. The, the second one is the, the second most correlated factor between high performance um, or between the people that performed at a very high level was their sleep, which is never, never pushed in that study. Like, yeah. No one understands that. The second thing about that is 10,000 hours of purposeful practice. Um, a lot of people... Like, for example, they hear the 10,000 hour rule, just say, yeah, I'll just do the same thing over and over again, 10,000 hours, then I'll be Tiger Woods. Yeah. Um, but they're not understanding that it's every hour they're there, they've got a purpose, they know their why. Like, start with why. That's, like, written for business just applies to your whole life. Mm. Um, start with why. Just understand your why, understand why you're doing it, and have that purpose there. That's, that's the difference between the 10,000 hours working and not working. So overall, you're going to get a client that's going to come to you and you've got an approach that says, right, we need to deal with all these different aspects. We need to deal with your physical, we need to deal with your mental, we've got to deal with your goals, we've got to get some purpose in your life because without it, you know, what is the purpose, what's the reason for you being motivated or continuing to do things? Um, and I think putting it all together becomes a very strong toolbox, if you like, to get people to make different changes in their life. So... Whereas a lot of people are saying, "What well, we need to get you to lose a bit of weight, or your goal is weight loss. When we're dealing with you, it's more about get, getting a, a better life in general yeah. that has everything else um, improved. So you, you will lose weight, but you'll also be stronger, you'll also be fitter, you'll feel better, you'll have better relationships with your partner, and all that kind of, kind of thing. And that's why, in my opinion, it's quite interesting to listen to some of your your episodes because it touches on all those different aspects and not all about health or all about fitness or or whatever else it is yeah, um, um, sorry go ahead uh, so going forward what's going to be your your next step do you think because you've come a so, long way so far right in quite a short period of time yeah it's, it's going phenomenally well um obviously i'd like to build the alpha movement into something bigger where i can help more people but the challenge with any business is as you start to scale the the impact you have on people could diminish so I really need to like help, like get get these systems absolutely nailed and like and work out exactly the twenty percent that carries over to the eighty percent because there's a few areas that are great and I want to take that into the kind of these are the the very small amount of things and apply that to everyone. Um, but in 
terms of how I'm helping more people at the moment, I'm working with like my, my platinum clients. I go and spend half a day with them, which is like once a month, which is hugely like massively transport um, transformational. But it's also very time dependent on myself. Yeah. Um, so it's it's finding out like how can I keep that. So I'm probably going to start running events, seminars, day long things where I can like probably twice a month where I can really really help people and help a large number of people at once and they'll also get the buzz of being around people in a group yeah. and they'll get more direct time with me. So yeah. I think that's how I'm going to grow. Try and get more people in a room at, at once and then can help them all at the same time rather than one at a time. Yeah, exactly. Um, to 80-20 rule, tell us more about what your view is on that. I mean, a lot of people have heard about it and they know that you know you get 80% of your results from 20% of your actions and things like that or if you've got if you're if you're selling something and you've got 100 clients 20 of them will spend 80% of the money and that kind of thing but how do you implement that into your your business if you like in terms of the business side of things or actually helping or, people or helping but how what what are the little things that people can do to get the most amount of benefit okay number one sleep yeah no, that is that is the number one thing as I like as I'll keep on banging on um is sleep um, the next thing is just get like regularity in your training. You don't need like I'm I'm, I'm going to try something that I've, I'm not sure whether it's a it's going to work or not. But this is an experiment for for myself um, and not other people. And if it does work, then I can like show other people. But the idea of training for about four hours a month and that for me is going to be really hard because I love training, but it's going to be using time under tension, which I've never really used before. Um, I've just used like athletic potential, like athletic training, what I call athletic training. So yeah. the big lifts, the like getting you powerful and strong. Um, but I'm going to try and just do that to see how it affects my hypertrophy, see how that goes on, because I'm still skinny little shit sometimes. Um, <laughs> it, will, it will pile it on you. Yeah. I can tell you now, time under tension, um, anywhere between four and eight seconds in a negative, will absolutely throw it on you. And if you are um, an ectomorphic body type who finds it difficult to put muscle on and easy to lose it, yeah. um, and also finds it very difficult to put any kind of weight on, even even fat, because the natural metabolism is quite high, that genetic type, the, what we find in the DNA testing that we do, is the, the studies are showing that that genetic type will respond the best when you're trying to put weight on by using that time under tension in the negative. Okay. So in, in that eccentric motion, keep it really heavy, slow it right the way down, and do not do lots of reps. Yeah. So it's very heavy, low rep stuff, long rest in between, do not do anything that will raise your metabolism, no coffee, no pre-workouts, no running, none of that stuff. Yeah. And you will see that the stuff will come on. But the most important thing is you've got to eat like a madman. Yeah, I can't wait for that. <laughs> I say that now. I say yeah. that now when I'm you're like, trying to put six, 7,000 calories a day down you of clean food, that yeah. is not fun. No, it's, um, I'm, I'm try I, I think I'm just going to resort to a lot of milk um, and okay. see how that goes. Um, just because I've tried eating a lot before and I get to that point where I just like, I get lazy with it. Right. So I'm finding that small small benefit again like looking for the, the easiest way to get around that and like I, I tolerate dairy really well so like we'll see how that gets on yeah. yeah yeah it'll be fun but it's like as I said it's something that I've, I've like not really tried with before and that's how I kind of see myself like the way that Tim Ferriss does it for example and the way that Ben Greenfield does it yeah. um, like looking at yourself as the experimental lab and just like and then applying that to the clients if it works. Um, so yeah. I'm a constant experiment. Like the four hours a week training for Marines thing, that was an experiment. Like, did I know it was going to work? Did I fuck? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know whether that was going to work. Um, like, and then looking at the way I train for the CrossFit competitions, like I didn't know that was going to work. I just did it. Like, see what happens. And like now, I don't know whether it's going to work. It probably will because I've done a lot of research into it. But like four four weeks to see how much I. Can weight I can put on that's, that's what happens so and it's basically going to be an hour a week of just some heavy lifting and some time under tension yeah probably two 30 minute sessions including warm up um, and I was like have you heard of um, the, actually it's in 4 hour body by Tim Ferriss um, he talks about Occam's principle right. um, which is one max effort set 
of a five five cadence, um, and like that's it, like one set. Yeah. So yeah. if I can do one set and <laughs> two exercises in each session, then I'll, I'll see what I can get. There's um, oh, what's his name? Doug Doug McGrath, I think his name is, and um, you can look him up on YouTube, and he does a lot of that work because he's a he's a big believer in isometric and heavy literally 15 minutes of putting the body under as much stress as possible um, and that's it and nowadays you can actually get um, but I don't know any gyms that have them but you, I know the manufacturers are making them now where they are um, putting together machines that are based around, along uh, the negative movement so it makes it easier in the positive but you can really stack on the weight and the negative um, yeah. just for that reason I can't remember who um like who was mentioning it or what it's called, but Ben Greenfield definitely did a podcast about it. It mm. sounded really interesting, really interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I did like, some. Sorry, go ahead. So I did some static contraction stuff years ago, where you like literally load as much weight as you can, and and you make sure that the muscles contracted under that load, um, and that was always interesting because that really pushed your strength up. Mm. But where your um, say five by five cadence or um, four to eight seconds in a negative. That will really help with um, hypertrophy, with actual yeah. growth. Yeah. So I'm interested to see what comes out of that. You, yeah, me too. Especially since like my last what since November, I've been doing purely Olympic weightlifting. <clears throat> like, got my snatch from 80 kilos to 95. Like, it's just been like my clean jerks gone up loads, and I'm like, I'm getting really strong, but yeah. I'm not putting on any size at all. Yeah. Like, just, like, I need that phase. I need that phase to progress to the next level because I've definitely started plateauing and like. I feel those injuries starting to tweak here, and like, yeah. so yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be great fun. How, how many days a week are you uh, lifting at the moment? I was doing five days a week. Okay, I've cut it down. Um, like honestly, I, I'm still getting results ish, um, but I just like, and I need a more personalised approach to things now, which is why I'm again taking my training into my own hands and like and really kind of taking it by the scruff of the neck yeah. and looking for that smallest change. Well, listen, let's hope it works because that would be a really good uh, method to start. Promoting fifteen minutes, or thirty minutes twice a week, including yeah. your warm up, um, and you yeah. can get these gains. I think there'll be a lot of people trying to buy that ebook. Yeah, definitely. Um, like especially with the guys that I work with, mainly like those busy professionals in in the city. That's like the majority of the people yeah. who come to me. So if, if I can tailor that to work very well, then we'll see what happens. Absolutely. And then the next problem is changing their mindset to to realise that actually you can do that and get away with it. You don't yeah. need to be killing yourself on the treadmill at five o'clock in the morning because you've got to be at your desk by half past six. Oh yeah, no, that thing's great. Like endurance athletes and and very busy city professionals, it just doesn't go hand in hand, does it? Yeah. It is like, and and they those are exactly the type of people that I, I typically work with. Um, okay, so if people want to find out more about you, where's the best place? So head over to my website alphamovement.co. Um, that's it's. I'm revamping it probably tomorrow. Actually, I don't know when this is going to come out, but um, on Friday it should be revamped. Um, and that will be. Like more catering, less towards mindset, more towards um, more towards that kind of eighty twenty kind of the wasting less time that kind of thing. Um, I've got a free twenty one day course on there, which is pretty fucking cool actually. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really proud of that. So if people want a twenty one day course, get on that. This email support and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, I've got Facebook, Facebook dot com slash Alpha Movement Official. I'm trying to get into Twitter, but. I'm really an OAP at heart, so I struggle. Um, yeah, everywhere search for me, Tom Foxley, and I'll be on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Brilliant. all those kind of places. Okay, so I'm going to put all those links in the uh, show notes, and um, anyone can just click straight on them. Go straight to uh, alphamovement.co, just .co, right? Just yeah. .co. Yeah. And um, check out the 21 day um, course. I'm quite interested to look at that myself, actually. Cool. And then, and see you on the course. yeah, you never know. You might get an email from me saying I'd like to join, but um, <laughs> we'll if see. I can fit it in. Wait, well, hey, listen, look, it's been great having you on today. Really cool. appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to get people to come over to you, and, and I'd like people if you do go to Tom and do their 21 day course, I'll really want some feedback from it. So let us know how you get on. Email me or get in touch with Tom, whatever else it is, just to see has there been any influence about. Tom, being on here today, has he picked up some new people he can help? You know, what's the value of this kind of work that we do? Because we do it for free, we don't get paid for it, but we want it to go out and help people. So I'm always interested when people take on advice that we give, 
whether or not they get value. So make sure you let us know. Okay, mate. And then until next time, which I'm sure there will be, um, yeah. good luck with it all. And let me know how the, the, the one hour a week um, sessions go. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Thank you very much for having me on the show. I really mate. appreciate it. Cool, mate. We'll speak soon. Thanks, mate. Bye.